Assalamu alaikum and good morning everyone. I am Dasir Hassan, PID scholar, Department of Zoology from Gormi College, University of Faisalabad. After successfully completion of our first day of third international conference on Applied Zoology 2020, under the shelter of the Applied Zoological Society of Pakistan and Qaeda Azam University, Islamabad, Pakistan. We have successfully completed our five regular sessions from different fields of zoology and one special session on current pandemic COVID-19 with all inspiring national and international speakers. And this is our second day of our third in international conference on Applied Zoology 2020. I am moderator of today's first session. In this session, we will include talks from the field of drug discovery, biotechnology, bioinformatics, and nanotechnology. So let's start our session with our first speaker, Dr. Nahid Akhtar from Gormi College University, Faisalabad. She will represent her work on biogenic synthesis, characterization, and therapeutic potential of copper nanoparticle using avocado seed extract. Please, Dr. Nahid Akhtar from Gormi College University, Faisalabad. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I am Dr. Nahi, uh, Assistant Professor of Biochemistry in the Government College University, Faisalabad. Today, I am here to present my research uh, title on the biogenic synthesis, characterization, and therapeutic potential of copper oxide nanoparticles using avocado seed extract. We, uh, as uh, everyone knows, the nanoparticle synthesis amongst the most interesting scientific field. Copper precursor is, as is easily available in the market as compared to other um, metals like silver and the gold precursors. We used the avocado seed uh, for the synthesis of the copper nanoparticles as avocado provides uh, a novel reducing and the stabilizing agent for the convenient and the inexpensive synthesis of copper nanoparticles. Wide range of the copper nanoparticles in uh, dimension and the surface to volume ratio make it more uh, make it powerful medicinal, uh, pharmaceutical, and uh, therapeutic agents. Uh, the, here is uh, um, uh, uh, presentation of the extract formation on the left side, and this one is uh, the nanoparticle synthesis, copper nanoparticle synthesis on the right side in uh, the flow chart. You can see here the characterization of uh, the synthesized copper nanoparticles was done using UV visible spectroscopy, scanning electron microscopy, X-ray diffraction, and infrared Fourier transform. Determination of uh, the therapeutic potential of the copper oxide nanoparticle was also done. Uh, we have determined their, uh, uh, here is uh, results the characterization of the copper nanoparticles by UV visible spectroscopy and XRD, here is the XRD pattern of the copper nanoparticles and there is FTIR assessment of the avocado A, there, this one is the A, this is for the avocado seed extract uh, and B for the copper oxide nanoparticles, the uh, FTIR pattern. It's the FTIR pattern for the um, avocado seed extract here and uh, the B for the copper oxide nanoparticles. This one is uh, the SEM image of the copper uh, oxide nanoparticles with maximum resolution at 45 degree. The uh, antifungal activity of the synthesized copper oxide nanoparticle was done by using the weld fusion assay. The fungal strains which were uh, used in uh, the antifungal activity were the aspergillus niger and aspergillus fumigatus. There is uh, the different concentrations for the determination of antifungal activity with the zone of inhibition. Uh, this one is the, these are the zone of inhibitions for the two fungal. The, you can see that 90 microliter uh, concentration of copper oxide nanoparticles showed a maximum anti 
fungal activity in a range of 8.5 uh, mm uh, zone of inhibition for the Aspergillus niger and uh, uh, 10 mm uh, zone of inhibition for the Aspergillus fumigatus. Uh, and this one uh, is the control uh, values for the two fungal strains. Copper oxide nanoparticle showed the enhanced toxicity against both fungal strains and it may become the effective antifungal agents uh, in further future research. Antibacterial activity for the synthesized copper oxide nanoparticle was done by using both gram-negative and the gram-positive bacteria. If like, uh, the gram-negative bacteria and uh, the bacillus such as the gram-positive bacteria, both of these uh, bacteria uh, showed, uh, uh, anti, uh, showed a uh, uh, good uh, zone of inhibition with the uh, different concentration with a uh, concentration of 10 uh, milligram per ml of the synthesized nanoparticle, which was the copper nanoparticles. The zone of inhibition for the E. coli uh, was 24 mm and for the bacillus substance was the 26 mm. It's a good antibacterial activity for uh, showed by the uh, uh, synthesized copper nanoparticles. The anti-cancer activity was also determined for uh, the synthesized uh, um, copper nanoparticles um, against uh, the breast cancer cell lines. You can see there is the breast cancer cell lines for the control and the breast cancer cell line. Uh, these are uh, the picture for the uh, treated breast cancer cell line. The concentration which are found to be effective uh, for these uh, uh, um, MCF7 uh, treatment is 150 microgram per liter, per 150 microgram per ml, sorry, 150 microgram per ml with a maximum uh, percentage of 90% and IC50 value uh, was uh, 72.55 microgram per ml. Cytotoxy activity of synthesized copper nanoparticle of avocado seed extract was uh, very good and in uh, may be used uh, and, uh, and it may be used in future as the anti cancer agents after further research the future recommendation of my research uh, is that as the synthesis of copper uh, uh, nanoparticles involve short, simple, cost-effective procedure uh, with high production yield, so it can be used in future for the commercial production of the copper nanoparticles for any therapeutic purposes or any other purpose it may be used. As copper oxide nanoparticles showed enhanced toxicity against various microorganisms like uh, the bacteria, both for gram positive and the gram negative, it may be used for the antimicrobial uh, as the antimicrobial and the antifungal agent. The biosynthesized copper uh, nanoparticles showed good cytotoxic effect against MCF7 with no effect on the normal cell lines. So, copper uh, nanoparticles may be developed in future as anti-cancer agent for successful treatment of the cancer. However, the need of some in vivo investigation is a necessity to find their role and mechanism inside the human body. All this may require complete study to reveal their role in antibacterial, antifungal, as well as anti-cancer drugs. It may be a powerful therapeutic agent for the future in further, in further research. Thank you so much. Allah Hafiz. Thank you very much, Dr. Nahid Akhtar, for such a wonderful talk. Now, I would like to invite our second presenter of the session from Qaeda Azam University, Sibga Batul. She will talk about her research on macrophages targeting for the treatment of cutaneous leishmaniasis using novel technology and drug delivery approach. Please, Ibga Batul. 
Hello everyone, I am Subha Batool, PhD scholar of Department of Pharmacy, Kadazam University, Islamabad. I am very much thankful to the organizing committee for giving me an opportunity to present my work in this international conference. Today, the topic which I am going to present is macrophage targeting for the treatment of cutaneous leishmaniasis using novel technology and drug delivery approach. First of all, the introduction. Leishmaniasis is a vector-borne protozoan infection which is caused by the Leishmania parasites and it is transmitted by the bite of the infected female sandfly. More than 20 such species are involved in causing this infection. In the life cycle of the Leishmania parasites, there are two stages. One is the promestigot stage, which is the motile one, and other is the amestigot stage, which is non-motile one. Among all the forms of the leishmaniasis, cutaneous leishmaniasis is the most common one in which ulcerative skin lesions are formed at the site of the sandfly bite. So how it occurs, the sandfly transfer the infected promestigots which permeate into different layers of the skin and they are engulfed by the macrophages where they are converted into the amestigot stage and then they divide and redivide to infect different cells uh, and then increase the risk of the uh, infection. Now the rationale of my study, uh, there are uh, many different uh, medications that are already available for the treatment of cutaneous leishmaniasis, uh, but uh, there are some problems that are associated with those uh, medications. So today I will talk about meltificine, which is HEPC, and it belongs to BCS class 3, uh, so it has low permeability, and there are uh, some problems that when it is given orally, it causes the gastrointestinal toxicity. Similarly, uh, it causes hemolysis with the IV therapy. So according to WHO, topical drug delivery is the recommended route for the treatment of cutaneous leishmaniasis as compared to other routes. So we selected transfer transversomes because they are biocompatible, they are highly deformable in nature, they are site specific and they uh, control the release of the drug. Next is the mechanism of penetration. The driving force required for the transport of transfer zones is basically the difference in the water content. And uh, this is due to the osmotic gradient between the dry skin and hydrated epidermis. So as you can see in the figure, they can pass through narrow constriction that is five to 10 times less than their, uh, than their own diameter. The formulation uh, which we developed had the particle size uh, less than 200 nanometer and zeta potential was negative due to the uh, negative charge present on the lipid. And you can see in figure A of the TEM analysis that uh, the particles are spherical in shape and they are homogeneously distributed. After that, in vitro release study was performed at pH 5.5. And uh, you can see in graph B that uh, the uh, almost 90% of the drug is released within uh, four hours. And in case of HEPCTG, which is our formulation, the drug is released in sustained manner and uh, the overall pattern of the release follow the frequent diffusion. Next is the ex vivo skin permeation study. Uh, and uh, this study was performed because, uh, as I told you earlier, that meltificine has the permeability issue. So uh, you can see in the figure 2a that transfer transversomes, uh, dilated transfer transversomes uh, penetrated into deeper layers of the skin very easily. And uh, so we can say that the permeation could be enhanced by incorporating the drug into transfer zones. However, we needed the sustained release of the uh, formulation. So the transfer zones were further loaded into the gel. After that, we performed the in vitro anti leishmanian analysis. Uh, and in uh, graph B, you can see that uh, the percentage inhibition for uh, HEPCT is greater as compared to HEPC solution. So we can say that the percentage inhibition of HEPCT is higher uh, against the leishmanian parasite as compared to the solution. Similarly, we performed the cytotoxicity assay and uh, we found that the cytotoxicity of the solution is greater as compared to our formulation. After that, macrophage uptake study was also performed because it, is, uh, it, is, it was the main objective of my study. So uh, uh, it is clearly evident from figure D1 that uh, the macrophages were um, macrophages uptake the transfer transversomes and they produce the fluorescence as compared to the control one. 
Then we performed the skin irritation study and histopathological study, and it was observed that uh, the positive control, which was 0.8% formalin, produced the toxic effects to the skin, and uh, the epidermis became thin and loose texture was observed. Um, while in case of uh, gel, they, uh, there was no toxic effect, and uh, it proves that the gel was quite safe. After that, in vivo anti-leishmanial assay was performed, and it was uh, observed that the lesion size was reduced in case of HEPCTG, which was our formulation as compared to the untreated and HEPC gel. So here I conclude that transfersomes are the potential drug delivery systems for topical delivery of anti leishmanial drugs at their targeted sites, resulting in better permeation, controlled drug release, enhanced cytotoxicity, and improved anti leishmanial efficacy, most particularly for the treatment of cutaneous leishmaniasis. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Sibha Patul, for very informative talk. Now I would like to invite Dr. Amreen Shaheen from University of Lochistan for presentation of her work on the topic of systematic analysis of fungicidal activity of silver nanoparticle against rhizopus species. Please Dr. Amreen Shaheen from University of Lochistan. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, this is Dr. Amreen Shaheen from University of Zool uh, University of Pakistan Zoology Department. I am basically a bio nanotechnologist, and in my lab, most of the students are working with uh, nanoparticles. So, what are nanoparticles, and why we are interested in nanotechnology? So, for the people who may not be aware of the um, uh, the recent advances, or even about the nanotechnology for them, it's uh, this slide is just for uh, as an introduction that. Uh, uh, nanoparticles are very very small particles that is at nanoscale level that is 10 raised to power minus 9 meter approximately equal to and uh, why we are interested in nanoparticles because they have very unique optical and physical chemical properties we can see them easily we can characterize them easily and unlike most of the people think that they are very expensive but they are not if you are working with them at the nanoscale level okay so there are so many applications of different type of nanoparticles but here uh, I will um, consider or we are working with silver nanoparticles so I will only give those applications. For example, they have um, documented antibacterial, antimicrobial, antifungal uh, activity and uh, at nanometer size. Um, at ionic st uh, and they are least toxic compared to the ionic uh, silver salts. That's why people are making uh, so many products using silver nanoparticles for um, anti-malarial activity, for anti-fungal uh, activity and that, that is what we did as well. So uh, my student, my MPhil student Bilkis Fatma uh, has worked, uh, recently she finished it, that work is not published yet. So we are looking for a very good journal to publish this work. So uh, we prepared silver nanoparticles in our lab and uh, with the help of uh, a microbiologist, uh, Dr. Ali Imran, we were able to grow um, the pure culture of uh, bread fungus in our lab as well. And then we estimated the um, antifungal activity of our silver nanoparticle on this bread fungus. So um, you might be aware of the fact that bread fungus, no, uh, that is rhizopus species, spoil the food. And also um, they have many um, um, effects uh, like on disease, uh, on human being uh, as a disease causing agent, especially for diabetic patients and for the patients who have uh, compromised immune system. So this fungus is very dangerous. So uh, it is a simple methodology of our research work or research design that is we cultured the fungus, we identified the fungus, then we synthesized and characterized our silver nanoparticles and then we estimated the, estimate the fungicidal activity of our silver nanoparticles. So here you can see that uh, we have fungus, first we grow, grow, grew it on the bread, then we inoculated it into the sterile medium and then we um, try to figure out the pure uh, culture by subculturing that fungus again and again. 
So then we were able to identify or uh, sort out our bread fungus on which we were trying to work and by Google images we found out that it is pretty much the same um, species on which we, we were looking to work on. So uh, there are some UVVs, spectra and peak images and uh, some uh, makings of nanoparticles on lab. As you can see, you can make nanoparticles on a very small scale uh, using simple uh, lab equipment that is hot plate. And uh, yes, most of the people are maybe of thinking that UVVs is not the um, um, ultimate source of characterizing our nanoparticle, but this is an estimation of the size of course the UVs can give the estimated size of nanoparticle and uh, somehow the um, quality uh, as you can see in this spectrum here that uh, there is a sharp peak which is an indication of monodispersity of cellular nanoparticles and yes we did some other characterization as well which for which we didn't show the images here so now it is the final slide in which uh, we try to and we are showing only um, three plate but we did these experiments and triplicate at least two or three times to figure out our um, you know average and standard deviations as well um, so here you can see that in p1 p2 and p3 it's a gradual change in the concentration of uh, nanoparticles so p1 has the most uh, concentrated particle then least and then the further less particle so you can see here at the day three there is not much uh, difference but at day seven um, we have less growth in highly concentrated uh, uh, petri dishes of silver nanoparticle compared to the um, less concentrated nanoparticles so uh, we were able to show that yes uh, um, nanoparticles do have a uh, uh, effect in in fashion of concentration like uh, with the increase of concentration of nanoparticles there is uh, uh, an activity uh, anti-fungicidal activity uh, of uh, uh, silver nanoparticles so thank you very much for listening us uh, time gone one seconds okay now Thank you very much, Dr. Ambishin, for your superb talk. Now, I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Saima Muzammil from Government College University, Faisalabad. She will talk on biosynthesis of zinc oxide nanoparticle using bacillus subtilis, characterization and nutritive significance for promoting plant growth in Z maize L. Please, Dr. Saima Muzammil from Government College University, Faisalabad. Assalamu alaikum. I am Dr. Saima Muzammil from Department of Microbiology, GCUF. Today I got the opportunity to present my work in third international conference on applied zoology. Uh, the research topic uh, uh, entitled is Biosynthesis of Z and Nanoparticle using Bacillus subtilis characterization and nutritive significance from promoting plant growth in Siamese health. Zinc is a micronutrient that is required in very small quantity, but it's, it is very important for growth of the plant, animal, and human. Zinc deficiency caused a great economic loss in agriculture sector as growth of the plants are affected by zinc deficiency. There are many uh, strategies to uh, remedy uh, the zinc deficiency and one of them is the use of the nanoparticles. Nanoparticles are very uh, small size nanoparticles, almost they are uh, less than in 100 nanometer in diameter. And the use of the zinc oxide nanoparticle can be possible alternative for uh, the zinc deficiency in the plants. They are very effective due to their small size as they can be taken up by the plants more quickly as compared to the bulk uh, zinc fertilizer. And thus the use of the, the zinc oxide nanoparticle can be hypothesized to enhance the uh, rate and to remedy the uh, zinc deficiency in maize crop. 
there are different shapes and size of the nanoparticles that are uh, uh, responsible for their unique characteristics and there are lots of methods to synthesize the nanoparticle as there is the physical uh, synthesis there is chemical synthesis and biological synthesis in the biological synthesis uh, use of the microorganism is a major field and uh, in the other side uh, plant tissue and different plant extract can also be used for the synthesis of the uh, nanoparticle as uh, biological synthesis is uh, eco-friendly as compared to the chemical and physical synthesis uh, so uh, in our study we use the um, biological synthesis of uh, uh, zinc oxide nanoparticle and then we characterize the uh, zinc oxide nanoparticle and after all we check if uh, the response of the maize crop to the nanoparticles. For this one, the seeds of the maize crop were primed at different concentration of zinc oxide nanoparticle at 2 uh, mg per liter, 4, 8, and 60 mg per liter. And afterward, we determine the growth biomarkers, that is, we determine shoot and root length. We determine the shoot and root fresh mass and dry mass and the leaf area of the plant uh, to check the effects of the nanoparticle on the plants. So this is the after synthesis of the nanoparticle. Uh, this UV uh, with spectrometry shows the peak at 331 nanometer, which corresponds to the biological synthesized zinc oxide nanoparticle. And here we see the same micrograph uh, of the zinc oxide nanoparticle and this is the XRD of the nanoparticle and these peaks shows the elemental structure of the zinc at the nano size. Uh, afterward, uh, the TEM uh, size was calculated by uh, TEM micrograph here we show uh, in this picture we can see the spherical uh, shape of the nanoparticle uh, and the size was calculated uh, according to this the FD size was 16 to 20 nanometer of these nanoparticles. This is the XPS analysis of the nanoparticle and here uh, we can see the elemental form of the uh, nanoparticle and uh, these graph and these graph uh, showed the uh, synthesis of the uh, zinc oxide nanoparticle. This is the size distribution by number and theta potential of these nanoparticles. After all this characterization, we uh, check these nanoparticle uh, on the plants and different uh, growth parameters were uh, determined. And here in this picture, we see that after priming with the different concentration of the nanoparticle, the root length and shoot length of the plant has increased uh, as compared to the control. And the uh, same is the case with, with the shoot dry mass, root dry mass, and fresh and uh, shoot and root fresh mass. Um, but here we notice that the uh, uh, significant enhancement has been observed uh, as compared to the control in the 8 uh, it, uh, mg per liter concentration. And after that concentration at 16, uh, a decrease in the root and shoot length and the uh, fresh and dry mass uh, has been observed. Uh, same is the case with the leaf area and total protein content of the plant. Here in this picture, uh, we see the leaf area uh, that is uh, maximum at 8 uh, mg per liter of the nanoparticle and protein content was also uh, more uh, here at this concentration. Maybe uh, this is uh, the reason that uh, at higher concentration, and the zinc uh, nanoparticle, zinc oxide nanoparticle, they have the negative uh, impact as the more uh, concentration uh, than the required could, uh, be, could reduce the growth of the plant also. So in the end, our conclusion is that zinc oxide nanoparticle can be effectively used as zinc source to overcome the zinc deficiency in maize plant. 
and nano priming could be an efficient technique for the better production of the crop so uh, zinc can be used as nano scale that is uh, uh, that is a revolutionary step in the agriculture thank you thank you very much dr saima mudammal for such a nice talk now i would like to invite our next speaker khatija abdul majid from punjab university she will present her work on assessment of synergistic antibacterial activity of 10 indigenous plant against locally isolated marsha assalamu alaikum my name is khadija abdul majid and the topic that i will speak on today is the assessment of synergistic anti bacterial activity of 10 indigenous plants against locally isolated msa methicillin resistant staphylococcus the emergence of uh, the need for new type of medicines arises due to the emergence of antibiotic resistance as well as the shortage of new antimicrobial drugs medicine plants can be defined as a group of plants that possess some special properties that make them as potential targets for drugs as well as therapeutic agents If you look at the use of herbal medicine today, a huge proportion of the rural, undeveloped, underprivileged population, particularly in the developing countries, rely solely on herbal medicine for their healthcare. Phytochemicals are simply chemicals that are produced by the plant through either primary or secondary metabolism. These include alkaloids, flavonoids, polyphenols, and terpenes, among others. Amongst others, and they are responsible for the antimicrobial and other activities that are uh, attributed to the plant. So what is exactly the synergistic action? The synergistic action is one in which the effect of two drugs that are administered simultaneously is greater than the sum of the effect of each drug that is given separately. What is the significant of significance of this study? Staphylococcus aureus is a gram-positive cocci that is found commonly on the human skin, and which is why it is the most common cause of skin and Tissue, soft tissue-related infections, as well as hospital-acquired invasive infections. Moreover, it also causes uh, the phylococcal food poisoning that is associated with the toxic toxic shock syndrome, pneumonia, and sepsis-related infections. Now, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA, they are resistant to many antibiotics genetically, and which is why these are causes concern for pharmaceuticals. On the other hand, the plant-derived my- antimicrobials they have advantages of being cost-effective. Easily accessible, having less side effects, and also being environment friendly. Moreover, if we take the synergistic effect of these plants along with the antibiotics, the synthetic antibiotics, they may provide fruitful results that would ultimately benefit the community at large. The aims of the present study were to determine the antimicrobial susceptibility of the isolated microorganisms for each of the plants. Then to characterize, uh, carry out the molecular characterization of the clinical isolate, and then to evaluate the synergistic effect of the crude extract of the plant. Next is the methodology. First, the plant samples were collected uh, from different areas of the hall. The uh, extracts were prepared by washing them with distilled water, drying them in shade for 15 days, grinding them to a fine powder, which is then used to make the hygienic methanol extract. Next, the uh, Microorganisms with six methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA isolated were obtained from clinical samples. The next was the molecular characterization of these isolates where the genomic DNA was isolated. It was qualitatively and quantitatively analyzed, and as well as the PCR amplification of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene was carried out to confirm these isolates. To check the antibacterial activity, the agar gel diffusion method was used. And two concentrations of the plant mixtures were taken: the STP 100 and STP 15. In STP 100, 10 milligram of each of the extract was taken, and in STP 50 was taken. The serial dilution of this concentration. In the results, as you can see from the uh, gel, the um, this this gel basically shows the PCR amplification of the 16 R S ribosomal RNA gene. And uh, as is visible, all the six mean strains had that the particular gene which are confirming their origin. Next, uh, the 
played, image of the plate basically shows the antimicrobial effect using the, the agarol diffusion method. Clear uh, zones of inhibition around the wells show the inhibition of growth in this region, in these regions by the, that is enriched by the plant extract. The graph basically shows the synergistic effect of the two uh, concentrations against the MRSA isolates. Uh, your X, Y axis shows the zones of inhibition in millimeters, and the X axis has the different strains of the MRSA. And as is well, visible, the uh, blue bars show the SCP100 high concentration, whereas the red counterparts they have the really diluted concentration. And if among, amongst all the extracts, the MDL01 is the most susceptible to the mixture of plant extracts forming a zone of 22 millimeters, which is quite uh, comparable to that which is formed by vancomycin against this. And so it can be used, it can be possibly potential uh, alternative for vancomycin having lesser side effects and uh, lower concentration being more effective. effective. So in conclusion, the resistance of antimicrobials is a growing problem and the future for the use of antimicrobials still looks quite grim. And even though pharmacological industries are producing new antibiotics, a lot of new antibiotics in the last few years, but the resistance to these drugs for microorganisms has also increased, which is an alarming issue. On the other hand, if you look uh, at the plants and uh, naturally available resources of thousands of constitu constituents, which are basically valuable source of new and biologically active molecules with potentially antibacterial properties. In the present study, we check the uh, extracts of 10 indigenous plants for the synergistic effect, which they showed against and the, the NP metaphorium resistance to forest, and they found zones of inhibition of the diameter that was quite large as compared to that of the individual extract. And the resulting herbal extracts they can be further used to control infection that are caused by multi drug resistant pathogens, having little to no side effects. Moreover, the anti Bacterial extracts they can also be used in development of biopesticides as well as for the preservative in processed foods where they will prevent the growth of microorganisms and also prolong shelf life of food. They, thus, they can replace the use of chemical preservatives that have been known to be carcinogenic. Moreover, the antioxidant and antibacterial potential of the plants will also help them to overcome the food security issues where, by pre preserving food naturally and also increasing the nutritive and value as well as the availability of food. Thank you. Thank you very much, Khatija Abdul for your nice work. Now I would like to invite Aksa Mubin from Agriculture University, Faisalabad. She will talk on toxicological effect of waterboard titanium nanoparticle in Septina Scarpio. Please, Aksa Mubin from Agriculture University, Faisalabad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. First of all, I would like to thank for the ICAST 2020 organizing committee that um, for giving me an opportunity for um, to discuss about my research work. Uh, that is about the toxicological effects of titanium nanoparticles in Saprina scarpio. I'm Phil Zoology from Department of Zoology, Wildlife and Fisheries in University of Agriculture, Faisalabad, Pakistan. Before the detailed discussion about my research work, I want to discuss about the importance of the aquaculture. So um, I want to discuss what is aquaculture. Aquaculture is an extremely important subject. It offers fish rearing information and fisheries growth information. It widely used it widely used for the processing of fish with regard to growing demand of fish in the world day by day. The, uh, the rising demand for seafood to meet future needs has also shown the significance of aquaculture. Water quality affects the growth and survival of fish as fish live in water. Therefore, regarding the growth of fish, water, temperature, pH, total hardness and dissolved oxygen play an important role. Information about all these parameters is given by aquaculture. Fish are generally used to determine the health of the aquatic environment because toxins build up in, in the food chain and are responsible for the adverse effects on the health of the fish that cause their death in aquatic ecosystem. 
as but as we know that the ecological conditions are dynamic and anthropogenic activities has significantly increased the discharge of toxicants into aquatic ecosystem the heavy metal and pesticides especially contamination of aquatic in the system has attracted the attention of researchers all over the world heavy metals have been recognized as a serious pollution of the aquatic environment that cause serious impairments in metabolic physiological and structural system of both animals and plants the accumulation of metals in the aquatic environment has direct impacts on the sustainability of the ecosystem but public sewage system and manufacturing based also cause pollution such that contaminants currently present on the earth and atmosphere the contaminants enter into the body organs of the fish such as gills liver kidney and muscles by water nutrients then next we move about the nanoparticles as we know that nanoparticles have vast range of diverse resources which consist of particular materials having size less than 100 nanometer if we talk about the titanium nanoparticles i prepared titanium nanoparticles by sol gel method the manufactured nanoparticles were characterized by different methods such as x ray diffraction fourier transform infrared spectroscopy scanning electron microscopy and transmission electron microscopy the important thing is to be noted that the individuality of nanoparticles was proved to be more poisonous as compared to their bulk forms as we know that titanium nanoparticles consume in different forms for example common carbon based toxins and microorganisms which tabloid industry beautifying products antibacterial and antiseptic configurations and uv resilient material however large number of nanoparticles mixed in the aquatic ecosystem and effect antagonistic properties of marine organisms the existence of metal oxide nanoparticles in atmosphere is global problem due to its bioaccumulation in industrial pollutants noxiousness and manifested in customer food stops Titanium nanoparticles are immersed in aquatic atmosphere with adequate amounts as compared to world atmosphere. Sewage treatment plants are um, considered as the important pathway for the spread of titanium nanoparticles in water basin. Various researchers showed the chronic toxic important impacts of nanoparticles of titanium which affect the marine organisms like catfish. Maximum range of titanium found in marine ecosystem is considered as 600 mg per liter for different fish species many researchers have described the histopathological and toxicological properties of titanium nanoparticles in marine species especially in fish organs here i want to discuss why i selected the common carp for my research work the reason is that the common carp is economically significant fish and extensively found in aquatic ecosystem and extensively found in aquatic ecosystem and shows about 10% of animal freshwater aquatic production in worldwide to measure the quality of aquatic system this fish can give interesting data various studies have suggested has suggested that carp can be used to measure the most damaging properties of toxins This fish have great capacity of measuring toxicants as compared to the other fishes like zebra fish Japanese meteca according to OECD standard this is the appropriate fish models for ecotoxicological research After that when I selected after that when um, when I have um, selected to 400 um, uh, milligram um, uh, day by day by increasing the dose day by day 
and when all the fishes are um, uh, to be uh, died in after the four days trial after um, uh, that um, uh, i checked the physical um, physical chemical parameters um, on the daily basis according to the, uh, according in toxic um, toxicity trials the main 96 hour lc50 titanium nanoparticles for saprinus scorpio was calculated as 168.58 while the lethal concentration was calculated as 289.249 respectively and this uh, this values will be given by the um, uh, were given by probit analysis method after uh, after the trial was completed i would draw my species um, from the cemented uh, tanks and dissect the fishes after um, uh, the dissection i separate uh, the fish organs uh, that i um, that i need that um, which are gills liver kidney and muscles after um, uh, that i clean the organs with the help of the phosphate buffer um, of ph 6.5 and homogenized in cold buffer through blender after that the homogenized organs were centrifugated for 15 minutes at 10000 rpm and 4 degree after centrifugation process the clean upper layer which was called as a supernatant was well maintained at minus 4 degree for enzyme assays although the lower layer which was called as residuum was wasted and then examined the lpo and gst activity with the spectrophotometer at 532 nanometer and 342 nanometer the trial was done for enzyme assays follow the various ways that are explained by buog 1978 and manabic 1969 respectively after the determination of the toxicological effects of titanium nanoparticles in fish samples probit analysis method used for the determination of lc50 value for the statistical analysis of data anova and cor correlation method were used to check difference and interaction between different variables after uh, after the completion of my um, of my research i found uh, i found that results during the experiment the temperature water and total hardness are kept as stable level um, after that the mean person mortality of the saprina scorpio gazed various concentration of titanium nanoparticles starting from 25 um, mg per liter with gradual increase up to 210 Milligram per liter was analyzed during a acute toxicity trial. In trial, after um, that, fish showed significantly highest and lowest overall mean of LPO and GST activity simultaneously, which was noted after 96 and 24 hour of exposure periods respectively in table. Here I here I want to show the mortality rate of the fish saprina scorpio at different titanium nanoparticles concentration during 96 hour acute toxicity test. The final results that I concluded uh, that. Uh, that I concluded that the pattern of um, titanium nanoparticles for lipid uh, peroxidation activity at 96 hour concentration and lethal concentration was recorded in under as followed. liver showed maximum uh, liver show maximum disabilities as compared to gills kidney and muscles when we talk about um, uh, the pattern of the titanium nanoparticles for glutathione as transferase activity at 96 hour concentration and lethal concentration was noted as followed liver show greater um, disability as compared to kidney and then gills and then muscles data collected was analyzed by comparison of means and analysis of variance and thank you so much for your attention thank you very much aksambeen and now i would like to invite our last presenter of this session mehran malik from government college university faisalabad he will talk on his search lly507 loaded iron oxide nanoparticle for anti cancer drug delivery applications please talk mehran malik please mehran malik from gormi college university faisalabad
السلام علیکم ایم مہران ستار فرام ڈپارٹمنٹ آف زولوجی گورنمنٹ کالج یونیورسٹی فیصل آباد اینڈ ٹوڈے آئی ایم گونا پرزینٹ دا ٹاپک ایل ایل وائی فائیو زیرو سیون لوڈیڈ آئرن آکسائڈ نینو پارٹیکلس فار اینٹی کینسر ڈرگ ڈلیوری اپلیکیشنس کینسر از کریکٹرائز بائی دا ان کنٹرول گروتھ اینڈ اسپریڈنگ آف ایبنارمل سیلس اینڈ اٹ از اے ہائیڈروجینس ڈیزیز ود اے وائڈ رینج آف جینیٹک ایبنارمیلٹیز cancer currently is the second leading cause of the death in the world after cardiovascular diseases but it is thought that in near future cancer will overtake the heart diseases both in term of incidence and mortality as it already happened in various states of america the basic reason behind that The chemotherapeutic drugs used for cancer treatment are non-targeted and they are producing various side effects like bone marrow depression and reduction in immunity. Sometimes these effects are so harmful that chemotherapy is terminated. According to a research, 98% of the drug is lost in the body because of its non-targeted delivery. This basic problem can be overcome with the use of magnetic drug targeting system comprises of various nanoparticles that can load the chemotherapeutic drug and deliver them to the targeted site. Iron oxide nanoparticles are one of them that can effectively deliver the drug to its targeted site. Following properties make iron oxide nanoparticles suitable for its biomedical applications. These properties including its biocompatibility, its ability to cross the biological barrier, its excellent magnetic properties, its long blood retention time and low toxicity there is only one problem with the use of iron oxide nanoparticles that without any surface coating they are unable to withstand in aqueous medium but fortunately this problem can be overcome uh, with the coating of various polymer like polyvinyl alcohol as it is biocompatible and biodegradable and it avoids the clumping of iron oxide nanoparticles in the aqueous medium and make them suitable for biomedical applications. This slide showing the graphical abstract of our work. First of all, the synthesis of iron oxide nanoparticles followed by the functionalization of these particles with PVA and loading of anti-tumor drug LLY507 for its targeted delivery in various cancers. Following characterization techniques are used to evaluate the properties of our prepared sample. First of all, EDS that shows the compositional analysis of our sample with various weight uh, percentage of iron and oxygen and AFM and SEM shows the size change of our sample that is between 44 nanometer to 100 nanometer. This is an ideal size change for biomedical application. In this slide, on the left side, the relative absorbance of the drug while loading is observed using UVVIS spectroscopy. With the increase in time, the relative absorbance of the drug is reduced while loading. That shows the loading of drug on particles. The overall loading efficiency uh, of iron oxide nanoparticles for LLY 507 is 97% and loading capacity is 
on the right side the drug release kinetics is shown and it is also observed with uvb spectroscopy the overall drug release efficiency is 94% uh, our research concluded that as cancer is the second leading cause of the death in the world with million of deaths annually and this number is increasing day by day and there is uh, unfortunately all the chemotherapeutic drugs having adverse effect because of its not targeted delivery so there is an urge for a system that can deliver the drug to its targeted site ioxide nanoparticle based nanotechnology a drug delivery system can be an effective alternate of traditional chemotherapeutic approach and lly507 loaded ioxide nanoparticles could be an effective replacement to reduce the systematic drug load and maximizes the effect of drug at its targeted site i am highly thankful to gomer college university faisalabad and center of excellence in solid state physics punjab university lahore for providing us technical support this work was supported by the hcc funded research project number 5653 this slide shows the references Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mehran Malik, for such a wonderful talk. This was our last talk of this session. I hope everyone enjoyed this wonderful session. Our next continuous session will consist of talk from the field of biochemistry, genetics, molecular biology, physiology, and microbiology. and ikra sarfraz will be the moderator of that session let's start our next session with ikra sarfraz thank you very much